Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Today's presenters are Dr. Stacy Berry and Dr. Mary Mache. Dr. Berry is an obstetrician gynecologist with Washington Township Medical Foundation. Dr. Mesh is a thoracic and foregut surgeon with Washington Township Medical Foundation. Um, I'm going to go over like a brief overview about obesity, how we got here, the impacts on our health, and then Dr. Mesh, who is our foregut surgeon, she's going to talk about surgical corrective procedures for treating obesity. What's the problem? Obesity is defined as having a BMI of greater than 30. That's one definition. It's also, you can define it by waist circumference. So for men, a circumference of the waist greater than 40 centimeters, for women 35 is considered obesity, unless you're of Asian descent. Asians have much, um, much smaller circumferences for definition of obesity. But the problem is, is that the rates of obesity in the last 40 years have tripled. And we've seen people get bigger and bigger. If you look at your pictures of yourself in 1960s and 1970s and the people around you, they were much smaller than we are now. We're all much larger. Um, and this causes all kinds of medical problems that we have to pay money for as a society, not just individually, but as a society. It raises the cost of healthcare dramatically. So even though the obesity rates have tripled, it, this has led to a quadrupling of medical problems in this country. The vast majority of our healthcare dollars goes to health-related problems related to obesity. It's shocking. So here's a little bit about BMI. It's one of those things that's hard to calculate at home, but there are some calculators like on cell phones and um, online where you could put in your height and your current weight and it'll give it to you, but your doctor's office does that for you automatically. So this is what normal is. So if your BMI is less than 18.5, you're underweight. I've been in clinical practice here for 20 years. I see maybe one underweight person every other year. Okay, <laughs> I'm serious. You know, somebody was 17.9, you're like, ooh, you're, you really need to gain, that's so rare. It's, it, we actually list it as a medical problem because it's, it's unhealthy to be underweight too. It's hard on the heart. Um, and most everybody in my practice is, has a BMI greater than 30. I do too. I have a BMI greater than 30. It's a constant problem. It's a constant battle. I get it. Um, it's it's uh, something I have to fight on and work on every day. So it's a very, we're in good, good company. So this is the waist circumference information I was telling you about. So for Asian men, a waist circumference of 35 inches is considered obese because they tend to distribute their weight differently and they have a higher incidence of certain comorbidities such as diabetes. So that's the, that's the numbers. And so we all know what the problem with being obese is. You increase your risk of having diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, joint disorders, needing joint replacements, gallbladder disease. A big issue that I deal with in my practice is urinary incontinence is related to obesity um, and infertility. So infertility is directly related to obesity in women. So um, in 1988, 22% of Americans were obese. Now we're almost at 40%. But the scary part is the class three obesity. Those are people with a BMI greater than 40. That has major um, implications for people's health. And that's the fastest growing rate of obesity in the country. But currently 7 over 7% of the population has class three obesity which is very, very expensive. As I showed earlier, the impact, financial impact to healthcare dollars. So, so if we take somebody who, who's obese and has these comorbidities and we put them on a healthy diet, it's estimated that we could eliminate or reduce 90% of type two diabetes, 80% of heart disease, 70% of colon cancer, 70% of strokes, 50% of dementia. And what I deal with a lot in my practice is breast 
and uterine cancer, is both, all, both of which are related to having um, obesity as a risk factor for them. And if this current trend that has been happening continues, estimates are that by 2030, the most conservative estimates be at, be at 40%, but other estimates put the, the rate of obesity as high as 74% in, in just over 10 years from now. And is very geographically dependent. This, this is kind of hard to read, but you can see things kind of in the south there, we have a big problem with morbid obesity, so like, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. The lowest rate of obesity in any state is in Colorado. They tend to have, they have a younger population and more physically active. So you need to know if you're at risk for any of these problems, you should know your BMI. You should know your hemoglobin A1C. That's the long-term snapshot of what your sugar control has been over for the last three months. You should know your waist circumference. You should know what your LDL is. That's the bad cholesterol. Most primary care doctors run an A1C every year on patients over a certain age. And your goal would be 5.7 is considered borderline. So if you go look at your previous lab slips, if you have an A1C of 5.7 or higher, then you're pre-diabetic. Over six, you're considered diabetic. And our goal for people with diabetes is to keep their A1Cs under seven, less risk of heart disease and stroke. So, and also know your family history. Are you particularly at risk? Do you have a family history of a man having a heart attack at an early age? That puts you at risk for heart disease. So you really wanna know those numbers and you really wanna keep them as low as possible. Do you have a family history of diabetes? Most everybody in this country has one of those, right? A family history of diabetes or heart disease, right? Almost everybody that I see. And then high blood pressure, of course. I love this slide because this is what Americans used to look like, right? They were farmers, they were thin, they were physically fit, and we don't look like that anymore. Active. Active. So we went from the American Gothic to Wally. -E. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that cartoon, but I think about it all the time when I see morbidly obese people rolling around on strollers with 64 ounce cups of soda, because that's what they did in the movie, it was a little more advanced, but that's where we're headed, being, that's being the norm. And we need to figure out how to stop it. So how do we get here? This is a new problem. Our ancient ancestors ate no refined sugar. They didn't refine sugar. They had sugars naturally occurring in their foods, but they had no refined sugars. 200 years ago, the average um, citizen would eat approximately five pounds of sh refined sugar. That would be special treats for holidays, cookies, cakes, those type of things that would be a rare special occasion. 100 years ago, seven-fold increase, 35 pounds of sugar a day, I mean a year. Does anybody have any idea how much sugar the average American eats per year? No. Guestimate? 10 to 20. What's that? Higher than 100? <laughs> 156 pounds of sugar per year is consumed annually in this country or for every American man, woman, and child. And the largest contributor by far is all the sugary drinks. So there's our, our Wally, our modern Wally, right? <laughs> he has a big soda with him, right? And we're getting it through our drinks. So that's the number one cause. We also get it in other places. We, the average American eats 130 pounds of potatoes per year, mostly in the form of french fries. Mm -hmm. And then all the breads. Mm -hmm. 130 pounds of bread per year and other refined sugars. We're bombarding our system with sugar. And a carbohydrate or sugar is an immediate fuel source. It's great if you're gonna burn it, but most of us sit and don't burn it. So we store it. So how did society get here? There's a lot of things to blame. You know, after World War II, a lot of women entered the workforce, stopped making meals at home, and relied on processed foods more commonly. Um, we had fewer home gardens. People shopped. More processed food, reliance. I mean, I grew up on Swanson's TV dinners, but that's kind of how we got here. Then after World War II, we also had all these technologies that made work less work. So instead of 
hand washing our clothes, we have a washing machine. Instead of um, hand washing our dishes, we have a dishwasher. All those things make us move our body less than we used to, to, to go through just our regular daily living. I mean, how many of us sit there and wash our car? I mean, my dad did that every Saturday, scrubbed the car, took an hour or two, waxed the car. We just go through the car wash now. Modern technology is good for a lot of things, but it's made us just keep thinking about that Wally character. Everything's done for us. We're getting there. And then our jobs have changed. My dad was a switchman on the railroad. He had to pull a switch, physically manual labor, most of us sit. Most of us sit all the time. This is a huge problem in my practice because most of my patients, over 90% of them are engineers. They sit all day long. If you put a fitness tracker on them, they're lucky, lucky to get 2,000 steps a day. They go from their car to their office. They sit all day long. They come home, they have a pre-made meal, and they sit. And it's even getting, now patients don't even have to go to their job. They can commute, they can work from home. They can sit in their jammies on their couch with their laptop and they're working, but they haven't physically moved their body. And we say that a sedentary lifestyle is the new smoking, right? So as dangerous as, we all know how bad smoking is. We learned that lesson, right? And the smoking rates have plummeted and thank goodness. But now we're seeing chronic diseases related to sedentary lifestyles. And so we call it the new smoking. Moving your body is critical for joint health, muscle health, heart health, okay? Then the stack was against us by our government on many different areas. We were all fed this pyramid, right? That's how we were all raised to believe that we needed to have 12 servings of grains per day. It's not true. Um, this is what has led to an obesity epidemic and has led to a di diabetes epidemic. We have way too much processed sugars, refined sugars in our diet. Um, and we were all told in the 80s, the culprit was fat. You had to go to snack well cookies, have high sugar, low fat. That's the key to success. Well, we now know that excess sugar in our diet causes an inflammatory response in our blood vessels, which leads to plaque formation. It's not the fat, it's the sugars. It's the sugars. So don't reach for the low fat, reach for things that are naturally low in sugar, okay? The FDA has a plate, they use a plate, where you should be having half vegetables, a quarter of your plate should be your protein source, such as your meat or meat substitute, and then you should have a small portion of grain. So it's not the pyramid, think of the plate, okay? A well-balanced plate. Probably like how most of our moms used to cook when she could, you'd always have a protein, you'd always have a green vegetable, and sometimes you would have a starch too. But the ratios should be 50% vegetable. And then the government did us another disservice by providing large subsidies to the um, growers of corn and rice and beets and sugar cane. We subsidize that. That's why a family can go through the drive-through or go to the fast food restaurant and get a meal that's half the price of cooking a healthy meal at home. It's all subsidized. And think of all the sugar that is in soda pop, all that subsidized. We pay those farmers to grow those things. Why? It doesn't make any sense. All lobbies, all lobbyists, um, and it's a very powerful lobby. Um, and then the, the government kind of did us another disservice by making the food labelings, uh, food labels very confusing. The biggest thing that should be on the label is the serving size, okay? You need to know how many servings are in a package of whatever you're eating because people will look and they say, oh, 50 calories, hmm, that's not bad. But that little package that you just inhaled is 2.5 servings. Mm -hmm. So that has been confusing and we really need to revamp the labeling. They're getting a little bit better, especially with the sugary drinks. There's a large number on the side which will tell you the calories in those things now, and it's a, it's a mind blower how much sugar is in those. Uh, I just saw a Facebook page the other day about um, the Shamrock Shake. Do you know how many grams of sugar are in the Shamrock Shake? 123. 23 teaspoons of sugar in a small Shamrock Shake. What is the Shamrock Shake? 
It's a seasonal um, milkshake that they have at McDonald's. For, for, yeah, St. Patty's, Patty's Day, yeah. So people think nothing of consuming a shake with french fries and a hamburger, and you're getting 200 grams of sugar in, your, in that one meal. That's four days worth, four days worth of sugar. Whereas 10, 20 years ago, I would have even been telling you about the fat. But now I don't talk about fat, I talk about sugar. And then we're bombarded with advertising everywhere. And it starts before our babies are born. When you find out you're pregnant, you go to the doctor and they register you, you start getting stuff in the mail for formula, baby formula. And then we all know about the sugary cereals. If any of you have children or grandchildren and you watch the Saturday morning cartoons, every other commercial is for a sugary cereal or a fast food store. So we're constantly being bombarded with images that make it hard for us to resist, right? And then we all have seen those shows where people eat those massive portions. If any of you travel internationally and you go anywhere in the world and you get a meal, as Americans, we're always a little shocked. It's kind of small because Americans like big portions. And it's, it's so true. I just encourage you, next time you're tra leaving, and leaving the country and travel internationally, you just be shocked. They're actually healthy serving size there. We have, we're addicted to it. And then screen, screen, screens. Uh, distractions are a leading cause of excessive consumption of food. I don't care if it's in front of the TV or a cell phone. If you're not sitting there and being conscious about what you're consuming and being mindful of the foods that you're putting in your mouth, you tend to overeat, right? You don't get that satiety clicked off in your head saying, I'm done here. And I know that I am guilty of all of these. We don't eat out of hunger usually. How many times do you eat? Are you really hungry? You have to ask yourself, am I hungry? Or is it just because it's breakfast time I'm supposed to eat? Or am I feeling a little sad? Or am I bored? That's my big one. I'm bored. I'm gonna go bake something. Okay. Um, and then I was raised, I'm sure as a lot of you were, on the clean plate award system, right? So you clean your plate, you get dessert. Yes. You know, that's the only way you get it. So you are trained from the time you are two years old. You finish everything on your plate and you're going to get more. <laughs> or what a good boy. You were such a good boy at the doctor's office today. You got your shot. You didn't cry. We're going to go get ice cream. Right? How many of us reward our children and ourselves? I, my entire residency, oh man, I work 36 hours. I'm going to go have a donut. I deserve that donut. That's not how I should reward myself. I should have rewarded myself with sleeping <laughs> or exercising. Those are rewards. So getting rid of this, and I have to tell you, my mother is, I blame a lot of things in life on my mom, but she is still so horrible about this. Every time she comes over to visit the grandkids, she brings root beer and vanilla ice cream because Grammy likes to make root beer floats for the kids. And so she has connected her love for my children with junk food. And trying to separate those has been extremely hard. We've had major battles over this, but food does not equal love, especially crappy food. Um, so that's where we are. That's how we got here. And how do you get started on making changes? Well, you need to know your numbers. You admit the problem. Yes, I, have, I am obese. Yes, I know my numbers. And then I want to start preparing my environment for positive changes that are going to make big differences long term and lifelong. Okay, So you want to prepare your mind, everything around you, and your family. You want to shout it out to the world saying, I have a weight problem. I'm going to be working on this. I need for all of you to be buy in on this. I want you to praise me when I'm doing well. I don't want you to get me an extra plate of food. I don't want you to insist that I eat when I'm not hungry. Okay, I want you to all support me and I'm going to announce my, my success and I want you to praise me, okay? And if you're having a rough time, I want you to reach out to me too. So telling people, they say, is one of the most su successful ways of making a difference. If you put it out in the world saying, I need to lose 20 pounds and I, need your, uh, I want you to go for a walk with me. I want you to, instead of going out to the movies and having popcorn, I want us to cut vegetables and prepare to go to the movies and have a healthy snack. So it takes a village, it really does. I eat first. I'll go over that too. So remove temptation. Um, wow, if you go through your pantry, your refrigerator, and your freezer, 
and you find all this stuff in there that you know you shouldn't be eating and just get rid of it, chuck it. I know that sounds horrible. We have a huge food waste problem in this country and it, or donate it if you can. Get rid of it. Don't have special treats for the kids around. They don't need it, okay? The, the childhood obesity rate is skyrocketing. We thought we got a, got a um, plateau on it, but it, the new numbers just revealed that it's actually going up again. So you wanna prepare your pantry, have lots of healthy options. You wanna make uh, good choices about where you get your produce and make it fun. This is, I think, one of the best tips to have is having a kitchen scale on the counter. I just came, I just came uh, home, my husband and I were getting our, our lunch ready and the first thing we do is we grab a plate, put it on the scale. How many ounces of beef should you have? How many ounces of beets? You know, whatever it is, you need to know what you're consuming and that's why you can track things. Getting a scale, measuring spoons. I talk to patients all the time about rice, how dangerous it is for the diabetics and I always say, you know, a serving size of rice is a half a cup of cooked rice. That's four bites. That's four bites. So not uncooked, cooked. Per, this, is, this is what my entire refrigerator looks like, all those little containers. So I do a, a, what I call meal prep on the Sundays, and I put everything in individual serving sizes, because when I go to work, I want to be able to grab my fruit, my salad, my meat, and everything's already pre-measured, so I don't have to spend, I can sleep in a little bit. And then I know this looks silly, but those are baby um, plates and uh, spoons and forks. And that's an old Weight Watchers trick. So use smaller size plates and smaller size utensils. Mm -hmm. So you can't shovel it in as fast, okay? And you've, you look like you have a full plate if you use a baby plate. Get a bathroom scale. This is what I am horrible about, but getting on it regularly. What's recommended? Once a week. So weigh once a week, same situation, like pick Saturday morning, buck naked after going to the bathroom, and weigh every week. And if you don't like what you saw, if there's an incline that's gone up, you need to figure out how you got there and how you can make some changes the next week. Okay? But if you don't get on the scale, which I'm horrible at, then it just slips away from you. You know, two pounds here leads to five pounds here, leads to 10 pounds here. Getting on the scale is imperative. Um, so that's just a little bit. And then you also wanna, if you have some close friends or a family member who say, you wanna share the, the data with them, even if it's good or bad. You wanna say, you know, I, I gained 0.5 pounds this week and I'm gonna try to do this different. But talking with somebody who can be a partner with you is very helpful. Um, if you feel comfortable, put it out on social media. You know, so say this is my journey, you know, and this is what happened to me this week, and, and people will support you. Set a goal, make it reasonable. I can't tell you how many people come in and see me and they say, I wanna weigh what I weighed when I was 17. That's so weird. It's not realistic and it's not necessarily healthy. Were any of us eating healthy when we were 17? No, we weren't. We were, I was living off a of Diet Coke and, and Doritos I mean, that's not necessarily a healthy lifestyle for an adult, a middle-aged adult. You wanna be thinking of something that's attainable and sustainable, okay? Maybe it's just gonna be a small reduction. Maybe it's gonna be a percentage, whatever your goal is, but don't have this number that, why well, was a size two when I was, it's not gonna happen. Not gonna happen, it's not, and you don't wanna live like that because it's too restrictive. You wanna set a reasonable, healthy goal that's based on health, okay? And, this is a hard one for me the last couple of years is uh, lots of celebrations in the family, kid graduating from high school, kid going away, going away to college, you know, another one graduating. It seems like every month is something. So know what celebrations are coming up and how you can prepare for them. So what's considered a good result? If you make these changes, what's considered a, a good result? A pound a week. We want you to lose a pound a week. And people are like, that's so slow. Well, think about it. If you committed to this and you lost a pound a week, in six months, you'd be down 26 pounds. That's real numbers, okay? Here, you'd be down 52, yeah, 50, yeah, you'd be down 52 pounds, which is life changing no matter what your current weight is. Um, and most people don't need to lose that much. 
So if you can lose 5% of your body weight in three to six months, you're considered a winner. That doesn't seem like much. So if you're 200 pounds, that's only 10 pounds. It's not that much, but that's considered a good result because people who lose it slow and steady tend to maintain it. That magic bullet where they can drop 10 pounds in a weekend or the cleanses or whatever, colonics or whatever, and it's just water, it comes back. And um, a 10% is where we see major health improvements. So in my job where I treat a lot of infertility, people resume their fertility after 10%, 10% body weight. So if you were 200 pounds, you got down to 180, we see the cycle pick up, ovulation rates improve, fertility rates improve. We see the same thing with A1C. At 10%, we see dramatic improvements in the A1C. Sometimes you need extra help, and it's okay to ask for help. If you are obese, and you have no medical problems, your doctor may agree to prescribe you weight loss medication, okay? So there are lots of different medications. There's new ones on the market all the time. They all have side effects. They're all just an aid, okay? They're not a way of life, but sometimes you need a little push to reduce that appetite to um, improve your metabolism a little bit. Some of the, like fentramine, um, increase, is a, it's a, amphetamine derivative, uh, so it causes you to have less appetite and speed your metabolism slightly. Xenical is one of, it's the only FDA approved medication that actually has been proven to result in long-term weight loss. That is um, a fat blocking uh, drug, so you pass the fat that you consume in your stool. And then if, even if you're just overweight, but you have a medical problem such as infertility or hypertension or diabetes, these medications are approved for people who are just overweight. So that's a BMI of 25 to 30. Other things, think about where you eat. When we were growing up, we ate at the table every night, right? You talked, you had conversations, you communicated, you enjoyed the food, you thanked the family for the food. Now, we're all guilty of that second picture, right? Sitting in front of the boob tube, mindlessly eating, not thinking about how the food tastes on our mouth, how it makes our stomach feel, are we full? Is it time to stop? Because we are distracted. Our, our mind is on what the screen is showing. And cook your own food. There's really no way to do this unless you cook your own food. Unless you join one of those uh, food services that sends you prepared meals, and there's a lot of good ones out there that do that. But that's expensive, and not everybody can afford that, and you might find that you really enjoy cooking your own food. If you cook your own food, you get to control how much salt's in it, you get to control how much sugar's in it, and make sure you have healthy fats, right? So you don't have deep fried stuff, you may have an avocado. And the hallmark of any successful program, I don't care if it's Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig or whatever, or Jumpstart MD, the, the hallmark to all of them has been proven over and over again as food journaling. So I always tell my patients, passes the pie hole, you write it down. You write down what you eat and how much of what you're eating, okay? Because if, if it's worth eating, then it's worth writing down. If it's not worth writing down, it's probably not worth eating. That means, you know, we're all guilty of it. Your four-year-old didn't finish their goldfish, so you, you know, finish them for them. Well, you have to think about that. That's mindless eating, right? So you're gonna, you can have it, but you gotta write it down. And that's why you can go back and see if you've made success what you did and what you, if you didn't make success, what you did as well. And also ask yourself before you sit down to eat, why am I eating, you know? And why do I stop eating? Do I stop eating because it's gone? Or did I, was I full? Why, you gotta listen to your body. You know, they say it takes 20 minutes from the message from your stomach to your brain, you know, that satiety. So you have to eat slower and eat mindfully and try to stop medicating your emotions with food. We're all guilty of that. Avoid triggers. Well, a lot of men know this top picture, right? The hangry. People get so hungry, but they don't recognize the trigger and they get hangry, they get mood, mood disturbances, and then they're around food and it just all 
comes into their mouth because they're starving and you don't think if you get to that point. You want to avoid being hangry. You want to be eating regularly throughout the day to avoid those spikes and drops in your insulin levels. Um, and develop strategy, strategies for socializing. I know I'm going to a big party this weekend. I need to go not hungry because there's gonna be bad choices there. So I'm gonna have a sensible, high protein, high fiber meal before I go, and then I'll be able to refuse things. Eating out. My favorite, uh, my favorite way of dealing with eating out is just bring a Tupperware container with you. You know you're gonna need it. American portions are just too large. When it, wherever, I don't care where you eat, there's enough for two people on that. Bring a Tupperware with you, take half of it when it arrives to your plate, put it in the Tupperware, eat the other half. It really, you feel a little embarrassed the first couple times you do it, but it, it really does help. And sometimes we just can't avoid eating out. And I know that I've been with a group of friends for the last 10 years where every time we get together, we're having cocktails, we're having appetizers, we're eating, 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 eating. And so switching away, let's say, I love you guys, but let's go for a hike instead. Let's go hike, you know, uh, Mission Peak instead. And let's not end everything or start everything with food. Food, food, food. Especially with kids. And the cheat day, you know, we always say, well, today's my cheat day. I'm gonna have whatever I want to eat. Redefine that. Yes, that's okay to have a cheat day, but make it just one meal of the day, not the whole day. So don't start off the morning with extra sugar in your coffee and maybe a donut. Eat your normal healthy breakfast, your normal healthy lunch, but you know you're going to go do something special. That's going to be my cheat meal, not my cheat day. Because we all need those, okay? You can't, you can't not do those in this society. So before you go shopping, eat. Before you go to the grocery store, we all know that, right? Starving, go to the grocery store, bombarded with all these images, and it, all this stuff falls into your cart. So eat a high protein, high fiber snack before shopping. So I would say hummus, hard boiled egg, uh, turkey rolled up with some avocado, something like that. It's gonna fill you up. Your blood sugar will be nice and stable and you won't be reaching for bad choices. And plan your week. So I told you I spend, on Sunday I, I plan all my meals for the week. It takes me about three hours, especially for my work meals. Cut up everything, plan it, put in little containers and go. So think about, don't, don't be in a situation as, oh, what are we gonna have for dinner? Let's just go out, right? We've all said that. Plan your meals, plan your meals. This is the best tip of any shopping tip that I could give you is just don't go in the center of the grocery store. Avoid the center. You just want to shop the periphery. That's where the dairy is. That's where the meat and that's where the vegetables is. Everything on the inside is processed and crap, right? You don't need the cereals. You don't need the prepared soups. You just need things that you can make at home with the dairy, the proteins, and the vegetables. Okay, so avoid those stuff. You could, you could just go to the periphery and say, is there anything I need? Maybe you need olive oil or vinegar or something. But just be selective. Don't cruise the whole, you're gonna end up with stuff that you don't want and don't need. So what kind of food should you be eating? You should be eating high protein, okay? Why protein? Well, is it doesn't alter your blood sugars dramatically. So when you, when you go up and down with your blood sugars, the down part is where you get really hungry. So protein maintains healthy blood sugars so you don't get starving. It satiates you better, it lasts longer. Like I was at a meeting this morning and the only thing they served, because our cafeteria is broken, was donuts and fruit. I said, if I ate that, I'd be starving in an hour. It's like the Chinese menu, right? You eat the rice, all that stuff, what, what happens an hour later? You're starving. So eat your protein, you wanna lower the carbohydrates, get rid of refined sugar completely if possible. And remember, sugar occurs naturally in our fruits and vegetables. So there's some fruits that are super high in sugar, such as citrus, and some that are low in sugar, such as apples. So you'd rather have the apple, which has more fiber and lower on the glycemic index than the citrus. And same thing with vegetables. Well, we all know that beets make sugar, so beets are very high in sugar, whereas celery doesn't. All the leaves are good, uh, spinach, kale, all that stuff. So sugar, sugar. So you get this all the time. No better, no better. Now, if it's raw hung, hun, 
raw local honey and you have seasonal allergies, there is some benefit to that, but it's best just to avoid sugar if you can. I know it's hard. It took me years to not have sugar in my coffee. <laughs> Don't even get me started on the coffee drinks. Oh my God, full of sugar. <laughs> Rethink breakfast. Do you want to ditch those sugars? So you want to get rid of the cereals and the breads and you want to switch to eggs. You want to switch to a piece of fruit. Plain. Plain yogurt, adding your own fruit oh, topping. Yeah. Excellent idea. Excellent idea. I like to use a lot of seeds too, pumpkin seeds, chia seeds, all those things, they fill you up. And again, they're low in sugar. Rethink your lunch. So nor normally for working people, we have a lunch time. What I try to do is take my lunch and divide it in two and eat it two hours apart. So I don't have a big full tummy and then a high blood sugar that drops and then you crash at three o'clock and you're like, where is the chocolate? I know the chocolate's here somewhere. So dividing your meal into smaller portions and eating it in separate, um, even though it's the same amount of calories, you don't have those fluctuations in your blood sugar and those cravings at three o'clock craving for, sometimes it's coffee, but usually it's chocolate. And then I have a simple rule in our house. I don't always stick to it, but nothing white except for cauliflower at dinner. Okay, yeah. nothing white. So no, no bread, no rice, no pasta. Nothing white after five, okay, except for cauliflower. Mm -hmm. Cauliflower is A-OK. -okay. And limit your after dinner snacking. I know that's where I get mindless, right? I'm kind of sleepy, a little bit hungry, more sleepy than hungry. What's in the pantry? Try to avoid that. But if you know that that's, you need that before you go to bed, think of little healthy things like a handful of walnuts and a piece of fruit. And this is what my week looks like. This is what I do every Sunday. My, if you ever came to my house, you saw my refrigerator, it's filled with all these little packages. So I, I just create little individual serving sizes and I grab and go. And then we can't always cook at home. So if you know you're gonna eat out, have a couple places, let's say you're on the run, your doctor was late, you couldn't make it to dinner or whatever. Pick two or three places that you know have healthy options. Like, I don't know what it would be for you, but um, we like to use Chipotle in that situation. Get the salad, add the black beans, add the protein. That's a healthy choice. You know, six to 700 calories, still excessive for sure. But um, I know I can grab and go and get something that's not gonna blow my week. And then bring food containers with you, if possible. So we need to move more. We talked about sedentary lifestyle. I want you to rethink what your idea of the best parking spot is in the parking lot. It's not the one by the door. You're gonna get more dings on your car and you're not gonna walk as much. Try to pick the furthest parking spot. Take the stairs, okay? If it's an option, if your knees can take it, take the stairs. If you use public transportation, uh, most of my patients work in the city. I always say, get off at Embarcadero, walk up to Montgomery. Get off a couple stops early. If they're gonna sit for eight hours, 10 hours a day, you need to make the most of your commute and move, move and get an activity tracker. They're so fun to compete with your friends, make set goals, break goals, and compete, okay? It's super fun. And if we could just take 30 minutes of our day that we would normally spe spend resting, reading, watching TV, and commit 30, just 30 minutes to movement, of any kind of movement, it pays off. So these are some documentaries that if you, um, I just put some resources in for books about the philosophy, cookbooks, and my favorite online source is a, um, a website called Yumly. If you are looking for low carbohydrate options and you just stumped, you don't know what to make, they have great, whatever dish they have, they have a low carb option. They have all kinds of horribly unhealthy things on that website, but if you're specifically looking for low carb options, they have great stuff. And then the um, app called Calorie King, a lot of us probably don't know like how many calories are in a head of cauliflower. I don't know, but you can put, the, put whatever you're eating to see exactly how much you're consuming, how much sugars you're consuming. 
Dr. Barry went over how we classify different levels of, of obesity according to your body mass index or your BMI. So we, de- we don't need to go through that, but we do use this same terminology to determine what's the best type of intervention or surgical intervention that might help you. And so we, we sort of look at this in our heads. A lot of times when people come into my office uh, trying to identify which procedure is going to best uh, uh, be best for them, I can sometimes just kind of take a look at the shape of their body and be able to tell them, you know, where they're going to fall in the classification and what we can expect them, um, how we could expect them to do with surgery. There are a lot of risks of being overweight that Dr. Berry went over. Um, we are able to help with those in surgery. Some of them, like type 2 diabetes, we can actually eliminate completely with certain kinds of interventions. Um, but some of them we can't. Um, the risk of heart disease or stroke can be uh, reduced, but it can't be completely eliminated because those are the kinds of things that are uh, set up early on with bad eating habits. So it's not just the weight that increases your, your risk of heart disease and stroke, but also the deposits of uh, cholesterol and other bad things in your, uh, in your blood vessels that will give you kind of a lifetime risk of that. Um, we can certainly reduce it by, by re- um, trying to get you to uh, be more comfortable in your own body and reducing the amount of weight that your body's sort of lugging around, but, but the actual disease itself we can't really get rid of. But many of the things we can, and so we do try to take a look at which one of these risks you already have, which ones you're likely to acquire if you continue to gain weight, and which ones we can help you with. Dr. Perry already did a very thorough job of going over some of the ways that you can uh, sort of curtail your diet to improve your chances of losing weight. Some of the things that I try to think about are what societies around the world have moderately thin to not so many obese people. Um, The whole Mediterranean area of the world tends to remain in check despite the fact that all around them people are gaining weight. So it's one, one uh, culture that you can look to, but certainly not the only one. So with that, I want to just kind of comment on why do we even come to the idea of weight loss procedures? Well, early on it was recognized that there were people who needed other kinds of surgeries that were going to help them in their life one way or the other. For instance, somebody who may have lung cancer or colon cancer. And because they were so overweight, their chances of surviving these surgeries became prohibitive. And so surgeons started to look towards the options of doing weight loss surgery in addition to the surgeries that would be curative for their disease process in an effort to try to help them improve their survival against cancer and other kinds of diseases that we operate on. So that's kind of how weight loss surgery sort of came into vein uh, quite a while back. In the beginning, almost everything that we offered was mostly in this category of more invasive. But now we have quite a few less invasive things that we can offer. Placement of a balloon, this thing called gastroplasty, which we'll talk about, versus even lap band is a little more invasive, but still not so invasive. And this thing called sleeve gastrectomy and gastric bypass. So we'll go over these options. When we talk about endoscopic versus laparoscopic, what do we mean? Well, endoscopic is like when you go to get a colonoscopy or an endoscopy to check out your stomach. There's a long, flexible tube that has a camera and a light on the end of it, and that will wiggle through parts of your colon or your stomach or your small intestine to try to identify abnormalities or, in our case, do procedures. So all the access is through the mouth. So it's really not very invasive at all. We call it non-invasive because from the surgeon's standpoint, it doesn't require any cutting. It is generally speaking outpatient. So you come in and you go home the, the same day. Laparoscopic on the other hand, requires some holes to be put inside your skin of your abdomen so that we can go inside and take a look at the outside of your intestine and your stomach. It requires tools and special cameras and usually a one night stay. Some people can go home the same day, but it really sort of depends on how well they do and how much work needs to be done. So these are all a little more invasive, also, although certainly not as invasive as some of the surgeries <clears throat> that we can do, which require big open incisions. Generally speaking, we don't really have to do that anymore. 
So this is a good example. This is an endoscope, which can be put down through your mouth into your stomach to do the work that we need to do. Versus laparoscopy or the laparoscope, which is this camera that has to go inside the abdomen with some other tools to be able to take a look on a screen to do the work that we need to do. So it's definitely more invasive and this requires a general anesthetic. So you're out completely. The endoscopic balloon is the least invasive of everything and it's the most easily reversed. We can put in one or two balloons. It takes about an hour or two to do. We put the balloons into the stomach. The balloons are then blown up inside the stomach and they occupy the space of the stomach. So now you feel full all the time. And most people are gonna lose up to about 50 pounds. Now you could lose more than that but they haven't really been into existence long enough that people have tried to lose more. So usually after 50 pounds, they're then removed. So it's a completely reversible type of uh, procedure. As you, can, as you can see here, the weight loss balloon is put in to the stomach through the esophagus coming down through the mouth. It's, it's deposited in the stomach and then it's left there. And if you have a really big stomach, we can put in another balloon. The pros are no surgery, no cutting, no general anesthesia. Some long-term weight loss will stay with you. It's pretty fast and easy, so you can get off pounds pretty quickly. Some of the cons are because your stomach is occupying the space, it makes it uh, challenging for the stomach to properly empty. So sometimes you can have acid reflux, stomach cramping. Some people will even have some nausea or vomiting. Uh, and this can also lead to some difficulty sleeping. So some of these things, if they occur, worst case scenario is go back in and you, you take it out, it's super easy. So the best part about it is that it's completely reversible and it's temporary. The next most invasive is what we call the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. Basically, this is a fancy word for saying through that endoscope again, so through the mouth, we're gonna sew up your stomach or button it up so that only a little pouch is left behind. So we, we sew on the stomach, we reduce the size of the stomach in order to be able to limit the amount that you can eat. It takes about 12, 12 stitches for it to work well and we kind of change the stomach from looking like a Boda bag into a, um, into a tube. So here you can see the stomach and here you can see the 12 stitches, one row here and one row here. And then the food comes down through the esophagus. And now instead of being able to go all the way through the stomach like this, it really only has the option of being able to go around through this narrow channel about the size of a banana. And this is all done from the inside. So again, no incisions, be able to go home the same day, really relatively little risk, not requiring a general anesthetic, all done through the mouth. It takes about two hours or so to perform. And as long as these sutures stay tight and in place, you're gonna be able to have this nice tight channel which is gonna shrink up your stomach and also limit the amount that you can eat. So the pros are you do get good effective weight loss, it doesn't take very long to do, it's safe and it is reversible. So if you decided that you didn't like it, we could go in and cut out all those stitches and your stomach just goes back to its original size. The downside is to it's not been out very long. So we don't really know so much how the very long-term results are gonna be. It does, it can cause nausea and pain like anything whenever you're working around the stomach, uh, but it is reversible. So if you did have some of these problems, you could go ahead and cut the stitches out. Laparoscopic banding is the least invasive of all the things that we do that requires cutting or more invasiveness into the abdomen, but it's still done with a camera, laparoscopic. A soft ring is placed right on the stomach to a, create a small little pouch. So what you end up with is a little hourglass shaped stomach where the top part of the hourglass is much smaller than the big part of the hourglass. We generally start to recommend this for patients that have a BMI of greater than 35. So the other things that we talked about are good for quick, short-term, minimal amount of weight loss, but when you start to need a little bit more, then you might start thinking about this laparoscopic banding or what we call lap band. And here you can see 
the ring goes around, this is the esophagus, this is the stomach. The ring goes around the stomach. This is the ring. And then there's a little uh, tube that comes out the skin. And then you put a needle into it and you inflate it to adjust to your ability to swallow. So what happens is after you get it placed, you go to the radi radiologist, they'll inject some uh, material, some water into here, blow up this balloon, and you're gonna be drinking while you're having that done. And you're saying, okay, I can drink, okay, I can drink, okay, I can't drink anymore. Then they'll take a little bit out and they'll leave you with just the right amount so that you have this small pouch up here and this large stomach. So your brain sort of perceives that your stomach has shrunk down to this small little walnut size, even though it has the rest of the stomach to fill up. The pros are it's adjustable. So let's say, for example, you know you're gonna go to a big wedding and you wanna be able to really eat it up. You can go and have all the water withdrawn and now you can fill up your whole stomach. So it's adjustable and people do use it that way. They kind of go in and out of uh, the office getting things tightened up for a weekend or loosened up for a, a party. Um, if you were to remove it, the stomach returns to completely its normal form. And the anatomy, so the anatomy stays completely unchanged. Um, the bad part about it is that, as you can imagine, weight gain is pretty easy after you remove it because once you put it in and you release that pressure by removing it, then the stomach goes back to its original size and you haven't removed any part of the stomach, so now the stomach can just fill up again. And unless you've changed your eating behaviors, you're not likely to be able to get any long-term results. Insurance companies are all also starting to sort of balk on this because they haven't seen the long-term results that you know they had once hoped for. The next most invasive is called a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. So this is similar to that other procedure where we sort of create the banana shape to the, to the stomach. But instead of leaving the stomach behind, we actually remove the outer margin of the stomach um, which in, also will take care of, of eliminating one of the hormones that causes hunger. So patients feel pretty full after they've been eating quite a bit less, and you'll see why here. What we do is we cut out this whole part of the stomach here, so you can see this here, this is the stomach, and we're in the process here of cutting out this whole area to leave just this tube, just this tube. So this is gonna fill up much quicker than if you had that whole stomach uh, to, f to fill up. So the pros are that in general, the food tolerance is pretty good. So some of the other procedures, you have a little difficulty eating bread, you might have a harder time with some bulkier foods. But in this procedure, you pretty much can eat anything you want, just small quantities. Um, very few complications, because it's a pretty simple surgery to perform. And there's nothing left behind, right? There's no balloon. There are no, um, there's no um, band or anything left behind. So it's easy uh, from the standpoint of not needing, not having to worry about an infection from an implanted device or something like that. The cons are it is major surgery. I mean, we are removing a big portion, most of your stomach, and it is completely irreversible. Once we remove that part of your stomach, we can't put it back. Now your stomach can stretch over time, but it's not likely to ever stretch back to the size that it was before, or at least we certainly wouldn't want that to happen. That's the laparoscopic ruin y gastric bypass. So this is the classic gastric bypass. So patients that have this done actually have a small pouch created. So very similar to what we already saw with creating that small little stomach. But then also we reroute your intestines so that you can no longer absorb the bad nutrients. Of course, you also cannot absorb some of the good nutrients, so we have to balance that out. But the good thing is, is that we can control how much of that intestine we wanna, we wanna actually bypass. We can bypass a big portion of it, or we can just bypass a little portion of it. So we create this little stomach pouch right here, and we connect the small intestine directly up to that small pouch instead of to the bottom of the stomach. So this still remains, your stomach still remains, but it's not really functioning. So all of the things that normally your stomach would make, the enzymes and stuff that we talked about before, do get produced and they mix down the road with the stuff that's coming directly from the stomach itself. So, but the anatomy is pretty changed, you know, it's wildly changed, right? 
We can also do things where if you're really morbidly obese, we can bypass a huge segment. And then over time, as you start to lose weight, we can shorten that segment little by little. It requires going back to the operating room, but it's a very effective way to kind of get people back on track from, for proper eating. Super good weight loss. Super effective weight loss. 77% of body fat is lost in the first year. And a good percentage of that is going to stay off long term. So it's the most effective long term um, weight loss uh, surgery. It also is a cure for type 2 diabetes. So it will completely reverse um, diabetes. It's not, it's the only one of all the weight loss procedures that will. Some of them will help to keep it in reduce it and get you close and maybe even eliminate it if you weren't di you know you were barely diabetic when you started but really brittle non uh, insulin dependent diabetics will be cured of their diabetes and very many people who are on insulin will come off insulin altogether with this procedure the bad thing is is there is poor absorption so your your intestine is bypassed and because we are skipping such a huge portion of the absorptive process the bad things are not absorbed and some of the good things are not absorbed as well. And so because of that, you have to take quite a bit of supplements in order to uh, get things um, restored to near normal anyway, as, as close to normal as you, can, as you can get. When you come to see us, the first thing we're gonna do is look to see, is your insurance gonna cover this surgery? Um, not all insurances do, many do, but there are a lot of hoops to jump through. Um, the first is, are you mentally prepared for the surgery? Um, you're gonna have to go through psychological uh, uh, counseling and your, uh, the psychologist will have to write a letter in effect to saying, yes, you're of sound mind, yes, you're ready for this surgery, and yes, you understand that this is a, you know, a, um, an, an, an irreversible change to the way that you're going to eat and live your life. You also have to demonstrate that you've joined and failed several weight loss programs. So um, if you haven't done that already and you're thinking about maybe wanting to do surgery in the future, first thing you gotta do is get into some weight loss programs. Give it your all because what the heck, if you succeed in a weight loss program and you can avoid the risk of surgery, it's certainly better than having to go through an operation. But if you fail, then your insurance company is, is likely to approve you. So in conclusion, we talked about weight loss options, uh, diet and exercise, like Dr. Barry talked about quite a bit, medical weight loss that has to do with taking additional medications to help you lose that weight versus surgical weight loss. If you choose surgery, does your insurance cover it? Are you mentally prepared? And are you ready for your life-changing habits? Because once you get the surgery, there's no going back to eating full-size portions. Uh, and drive through um, uh, meals, right? It's not gonna be something that you can ever really do again. There are now lots of effective, less invasive interventions that go through the mouth, require a non-full-on general anesthesia, but just a light sedation, and the ability to go home the same day. And then more invasive surgeries, which are still minimally invasive, but nonetheless invasive, such as the banding, the lap band, or we call removing part of the stomach, or the gastric bypass, which are really alter the way that your plumbing is rooted, um, but very effective in controlling different disease processes. And this is something to think about. Shrinking someone's stomach into the size of a walnut with surgery is one way to battle obesity and diabetes and maybe life-saving for a few but it doesn't address the underlying cause. So what you really have to think about before you go decide for surgery is, what is your cause? Are you on a seafood diet? Everything you see, you eat? Are you on a, I'm gonna measure my waist and, my, and eat healthy every day with a little bit of exercise? Are you really working at working out to try to lose weight? Are you going to change your lifestyle? Are you seeking counseling to find out what it is inside that makes you want to eat and not be able to push food away? Are you trying a medical weight loss program with pills? Or are you ready for the Lego operating room? And that's it. That's all I have to say. Thanks very much.